Hello everyone. You know, I never thought I'd be nostalgic for e-machines, but here we are. The future is weird. Here we have one of the infamous never obsolete e-machines e-towers, as well as one of those post-beige Robocop looking towers from the mid-2000s. My brother actually had one of these machines back in the day when it was new, so seeing it again is kind of sending me. Alright, let's tear into these. Yeah, you knew I was going to start with this one. Of course I am. The famous never obsolete e-machines. A miracle of computing technology that only e-machines could muster, complete with all of its original stickers. They sure were optimistic, weren't they? This is of course just a marketing brainworm for something called the e-machines network. That was a scheme where you could pay the low, low price of $19.95 per month in exchange for fast, reliable internet access from some MCI contrivance. Surf, email, invest in the dot-com bubble. It even included Netscape. But most crucially, you were given the option to upgrade your computer every two years for just $99. And all you need is for e-machines to stay in business forever. I'm so curious if anyone watching has actually used this service. I'd really like to know the specs of the computers that you're receiving as upgrades, but I have a feeling this service may not have been targeted to the demographics that pay attention to computer specs. Just a hunch. Another interesting side note is these computers were often sold with multiple rebates. If you were judicious enough to follow through with all of them, the computer could actually be free, and I say free with exaggerated air quotes. You can't see them, but I'm doing them. Funny enough, some of the largest rebates came as part of signing up for internet service, which was completely separate from the MCI thing that you'd get from the anti-obsolescence e-machines network plan, so how would that have worked? And just to confuse grandma even further, there's AOL throwing their marketing dollars into the pot. This machine is just the perfect example of the late 90s and early 2000s race to the bottom crapola that permeated consumer tech at the time. What a time to be alive. See we're sporting an Intel Helleron? We are badged for Windows 98. Even though this machine actually comes with Windows ME. We've got a lovely spec sheet here. Fairly well preserved. Yeah, it's hard not to get excited over those specs. We are unfortunately missing the port cover down here. But what are you going to do? We do of course have the original drives. And that floppy drive looks awfully special. That is a very custom faceplate. Hopefully we can convince it to work. And the front of this case took a little bit of a hit. See it nicked the never obsolete label up here. We also have a few plastic scuffs, but overall, not too bad. And here's even more proof that the Windows 98 badge is full of lies. There's our Windows ME COA sticker. And this side of the case has a giant embossed E-Machines E. It's actually pressed into the metal. We do have some paint problems here. Lots of scratches. That's too bad, but it could be worse. And here's a look at the back. And they really wanted to highlight that serial number. I guess users were having trouble finding it. There's no missing that. I see we have an SFX power supply in here, as opposed to a regular ATX power supply. It's still pin compatible with ATX power supplies. I guess with this being a smaller case, there just wasn't room for a standard ATX power supply. And in true E-Machines ease of use fashion, all the ports are clearly marked, with just about everything on board. Though I guess they couldn't spring for a second USB port. These were budget machines after all. And there's the 56k dial-up modem we were promised, as well as a NIC. Here's a good look at that label. These systems are manufactured by a company called TriGem. TriGem was actually Korea's first computer manufacturer. I actually found a TriGem branded hard drive several videos ago, but it looked an awful lot like a rebadged Samsung. And there's our license key for the Power DVD software. That's an interesting place for it. And I see somebody's been in here, so we won't be harming any warranties yet. Okay, let's get this thing open. But first, we have one small issue. This locking tab took a hit and got rolled over. This is for actually attaching a padlock or whatever to keep you from opening the case. So let's just bend that back into position. Close enough. Now with all those screws out, this case opens up just like an old school or older school AT case with the entirety of the outer metal pulling off. All right, we do have a hard drive. It looks like a quantum fireball. That may or may not be a good thing. And the top of the inner frame has these handles here. I'm not sure if that's just for supporting that arch because the top of the system is arch shaped. I guess just to make it inconvenient for putting things on top of it. But they also serve as some rather uncomfortable carrying handles. Hey, I'll take it. And that's a rather Spartan looking motherboard. I love how it boasts AGP graphics on that sticker, but doesn't have an AGP port. 
And that just means the onboard GPU is connected via the AGP bus, but it sure would have been a letdown if you bought this thing expecting to be able to upgrade the AGP graphics. And through some kind of miracle, all of these capacitors look okay so far. E-Machines was one of those manufacturers that was fully embroiled in the capacitor plague, so that's actually really surprising to see. And it looks like that Ethernet nick was maybe added later, because that's a different type of screw. Let's actually start with that one. And that's a classic 3Com nick with the parallel tasking chipset. Pretty dirty, just like the rest of the system. We are very dusty. Interesting, we have the data rate written in copper here. 10100, of course. In fact, all that text is written in copper. That's an interesting way to do it. Now, let's see that modem. Some kind of conic sand thing. I'm sure it's E-Machine's original, but there are no stickers confirming so. Now let's purge these cables. Who would have guessed E-Machine's would have such fine cable management? I can just pull this entire bundle all at once. Brains. Or in the case of the Celeron, lack thereof. Yep, definitely a Helleron, with the thermal paste all the way perished. Let's get that out of there. And it does match the clock speed foretold on the front panel sticker. 633 MHz, 128K of cache, and 66 MHz front side bus. And judging by how stuck that thermal paste was, I'm probably the first person to ever pull this out. So the pins are good. Let's see what we got for RAM. That's allegedly a 128 meg stick, PC100. So we have had some upgrades. Yeah, it's dirty, but it could be worse. Let's check out the other one. And that is a mystery stick. It sure is shiny though. At least I can see it's PC100. Wonder why this one's so shiny and the other one's so dirty. Very strange. Okay, let's get the CPU cleaned up. And this might take some scraping. Oh, it's actually coming off pretty easily with just the IPA. Yeah, it was actually pretty easy. Now let's check the condition of that fan bearing. Hey, not bad at all. That's totally healthy fan noise. It just needs a good cleaning. Though weirdly enough, we have two loose screws. And this one was actually barely in there. Wonder how that happens. Yeah, these things are right on the edge of falling out and causing all kinds of mischief. And this one doesn't want to thread out at all. I'm using the lightest possible touch I can on that screwdriver. I'm gonna have to lift up on the fan. Let's see if this one comes out. Yeah, that one's doing what it's supposed to do. What did somebody do to this thing? They certainly weren't cleaning it. Yeesh, not safe for lungs. They sure gave themselves plenty of margin of error for that thermal compound. I do love how easy it comes off though. This stuff is usually pretty annoying. Well, that's as clean as that's getting, and that's as clean as it needs to be. Okay, let's get this motherboard out of here because this thing needs deep dust removal. I sure love these no guesswork front panel connectors. Got the CPU back in there to prevent the dust from going in the socket. Sweep, sweep. Now let's see what our battery level is. Basically nothing. Now let's dress that chip. Now 
Now let's check out those drives. And surely the floppy drive can slide out the back, right? Sure can. Oh, that's dusty. And that hard drive appears to be original to the system. 20 gig quantum fireball. That matches the capacity stated on the front label. I'm not sure how to interpret any of those markings as a date code, but it's gotta be from the year 2000, judging by the rest of the system. And the floppy drive is made by TriGem, model SFD321B. The actual manufacturer is Samsung. That's interesting. The TriGem hard drive I found a while back was actually a Samsung. It even identified as such during post. I guess they had some kind of a deal. There are some signs of cost cutting on this thing. For example, they reduced the number of ground pins by 50%. I wonder how much that saved them. Yeah, it does appear to be quite special. I doubt that any old random floppy drive would work well in this faceplate. And these particular drives could be hard to find, although I haven't looked. Fortunately, I don't need to. Unless this one's dead, of course. I probably just jinxed myself. Yep, probably too late to walk that one back. The spindle seems just slightly sticky. It's not bad, but they usually free spin a lot more than that. Maybe that's just how it is. Okay, let's get this thing open. It had a single screw on the top here, and then I guess this just slides back. There we go. And actually, it's surprisingly clean in here. That's kind of remarkable, given the condition of the rest of the system. It does just have a light coating of dust here and there. Let's just give it a good sweeping. Okay, let's do some basic maintenance now. Clean those heads. Not bad at all. Now I'll clean up and refresh all this grease. And we'll replace that with white lithium grease. Let's not forget the lead screw. And the Samsung this continues with the DVD drive. You are in the presence of the DVD master. That's a Samsung DVD Master 12E, manufactured June 2000. Let's wipe that dust off without pushing it deeper inside. Okay, I wanna go ahead and dry fire this thing just to see if it opens or not. Okay, well, it's blinking. Let's see. Yep, opens just fine. And closes. That's always a bonus. It does feel like a good quality drive. It has plenty of weight to it. We'll see if it can live up to that assumption. And this little power supply is so cute, but it is sketchy and dusty. I'm actually gonna take it apart and clean it, as well as search for capacitor plague evidence. Yeah, what a mess. But component-wise, we're actually looking pretty good. And at least it has a disconnectable fan. So many power supplies don't. We can get rid of that for now. Okay, after de-dustifying this thing and gaining three asthma points, we're looking pretty good. So let's proceed to test. This thing is almost the size of my power supply tester. Well, let's get it tested. All right, we're doing good so far. Click, click. That's five minutes and we are good. And not seeing any crazy temperatures, so we are definitely good. Okay, I wanna get behind this faceplate because I bet it's a mess. Luckily, that looks like just a plastic clip operation. Yeah, that was pretty easy. And actually, not very dirty at all. Just a little dusty. And since I'm not asthmatic enough... <coughs> I gotta start using the respirator. Okay, we are fully back together. The system may transcend obsolescence, but does it work? Let's find out. And it turns on from just power. And it is posting. Okay, well, it doesn't seem happy. Oh, okay, maybe it was just a little slow. Okay, we're good with the defaults. Let's continue. Ah, we've got a broken install of NT something. 
So I guess we're not getting into the OS. Let's just reboot. And now we're complaining about the date and time. Let's actually go ahead and set that. I bet this thing never thought it would make it to this era. All right, let's save that. I'm sure that won't help our booting problem. Yeah, that NT install is hooped. Well, let's try booting up to Canopics and see if I can get anything out of that drive. I'm gonna try 9.1 because my 3.8 disc is missing in action. That drive doesn't sound happy, but well, let's see. And yeah, we did not attempt to boot from CD. Let me just make sure that's configured. Yeah, that's the first boot device. So either that drive doesn't work or it doesn't read CDRs. It could go either way with these older drives. Well, can we at least boot from floppy? No, doesn't sound good. Wow, two bad drives so far? I think that e-machine's cheapness is showing through. Let's give that one more chance. I know that disc is good. Okay, got a little further that time. Let's see if we'll make it. I guess it maybe just needed to distribute its grease. And seeing as it assigned the RAM drive C drive, the hard drive either has an NTFS partition or no partition. But let's give that DVD drive one more chance. Yeah, I'd say that's not happening. Yep, no good. Well, let's see if it'll read a regular CD. Retry. And it reads regular CDs. Okay, well, at least it partially works. Being able to read CDRs was hit or miss even back in the day. Okay, I swapped in a drive that will read CDRs, because we gotta get into Canopics. And a rather enthusiastic drive as well. Here we go. Well, that never obsolete claim is not holding up very well so far. This thing is taking forever to boot. I'm actually just gonna try to break out into a terminal because it's been like 10 minutes already. There we go. Let's see if we even see that hard drive. Oh, got some keyboard lag. <laughs> that is awful. I guess that little CD-ROM drive is just enough to saturate the bus. Okay, we do see that drive and it does have a partition on it. Let's see what kind of partition that is. Surely FS tab picked it up. It is NTFS. Let's go ahead and mount that. See how long that takes. That only took a minute and 45 seconds. Totally normal. Let's see if we have some data on that thing. Okay, it does have Windows install. That is most definitely Windows XP. So I wonder why it won't boot. Should I really attempt to repair this install? I notice we don't have a boot.ini or any of the other root directory files you normally see on Windows XP. You know what? Let's try to repair it. Let's just make sure that's cleanly unmounted. Ah, of course it's busy. Let's get our Windows XP install disk in there. Automated system recovery. Ah, oh, that's right, I need the floppy disk. Okay, forget that. Cancel. And we get no repair option. I'm pretty sure that's an install of Home Edition anyway. Oh well. Let's get back up to Canopics and do an error check on it. And for doing that, we're gonna use the bad blocks command. We're gonna do a non-destructive read-write test. Although I don't really care about the data that's on there. So it's gonna be bad blocks. I think that's NSV. Let me point that to dev SDA and see what we get. This could take a while. Either it tested that single block within an inch of its life, or this is just incredibly slow. 
Let's see how long it takes to get to 0.02%, but it's looking like I'm just gonna cancel this. Hmm, two and a half minutes to get there, huh? I'm not gonna do the math, but that looks like it's gonna take absolutely forever. So, let's cancel that. And it took two minutes and 44 seconds to do 4,700 blocks. According to my back of the envelope math, that would have taken about 192 hours. Yeah, I don't have that kind of time. Let's see if we can just do a straight read test. Maybe that's more reasonable. Yeah, I deleted my status indicator option. But it seems like that's taking just as many forevers. Although, not nearly as bad. But that is still absurdly slow. I wonder why. Let's see what speed we're even reading at. Let's just read that entire hard drive into dev null. See how fast it reads at all. Yeah, not fast at all. And honestly, it sounds like it's struggling a little bit. I think the hard drive is probably no good. Yeah, it's just getting slower and slower. Okay, since I'd hate to falsely accuse a good drive, I've got it connected up to my bench PC, just so I can rule out any IDE bus shenanigans. So let's retest. And I'm pretty sure that's dev slash sdb. Yep, that's it. Yeah, it looks like we're struggling just as much. And it's making some very struggly sounds. Well, I guess that confirms it. This drive is no good. It's a shame it's too quiet to qualify for a sacrificial hard drive candidate. And I just realized that looks like a plus sign to the camera. It's actually an X. It looked like an X from my angle. <laughs> okay, I managed to locate my Canopix 3.8 disc. I got that hard drive back connected, all for the sole purpose of pulling the smart data, because I'm curious to see how many hours are on that drive. Embiggen U. And to access that, we use smart CTL. We're gonna run all commands, and that's slash dev slash HDA on here, since we're not doing SCSI emulation. Let's see what that has to say. Ooh, it's got lots to say. 53,397 hours. <laughs> yeah, that thing had quite a life. 2,224 days and 21 hours. That's a little over six years of runtime. Yeah, I guess I can't blame that hard drive for being dead. Let's see, what else does Smart CTL have to say? Yeah, just lots of errors. Kind of figured that. And that six year estimate is all runtime. It means this drive was literally powered on for six years worth of time. And even with all that, it still passes its own self-assessment. All right, that's all I wanted out of this. Well, we certainly can't fault this thing for the issues it has. Six years of runtime certainly explains all that dust. I'm honestly surprised things weren't worse inside. I wonder what that six years averages out to in total lifetime, because that's six years of total power on time. But give this thing a good hard drive and a slightly more literate optical drive, and it may yet fulfill its promise of conquering obsolescence. Let's move on to the next system. And I have been dying to tear into this one, for the sake of my own nostalgia triggers, the Robocop E-Machines. Come on, you can't tell me that doesn't kinda look like Robocop. I don't know, it just does to me. My brother had a machine very similar to this. It had the exact same case styling, except his had an Athlon 64, and this one is sporting a Helleron, and AOL was still trying their luck. AOL was very much on their way to being dead when this machine came out. And down here we have a flip-up port cover for all your audio and USB needs. And how generous of them. They're giving you two USB ports this time. Ah, that thing is sticky. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. Yeah, I bet you can't unsee it now. That is our original CD burner, obviously. And this missing cover down here would have been a floppy drive and or a media card reader. I don't know, I might need to hit up eBay and try to find one. And they certainly were generous with the onboard ports. Look at that, six USB ports, plus two in the front. They even had legacy printer users in mind, although no serial port. And somebody stole my VGA port screws. Good thing I have a million of them. And our lone dial-up modem, holding down the last PCI slot. And this thing is surprisingly heavy for such a cheap machine. So let's get into this thing and find out why. It's interesting that they're using an AS Rock motherboard. Pretty sure the one from my brother's machine is an MSI. 
I guess they were just using any old off-the-shelf motherboard at this point. And hey, at least it has an AGP slot. And also quite remarkably, I don't see signs of the capacitor plague in this machine so far. Did I really dodge two bullets in one video? And I think this machine is even more dusty than the last one. Let's get that dial-up modem out of there. Basic, basic. Ultra cheap Connex Ant 56K. It'll get the job done. And for those of you wondering what this slot is, that's called an AMR1 slot. I think that stands for audio modem riser or something like that. And that's what it was intended to do. Provide connectivity for a sound card and or modem, presumably with a goal to free up a PCI slot or two. And it never really took off. And it had a lot of people puzzled as to its usefulness, even back in the day. <laughs> okay, what is this contraption they have on the CPU here? Obviously it's intended to pull air through the side vents, but it is very much in my way. So let's get it out of there. Get rid of that power connector first. Disconnect that fan. Now, see how this goes. Okay, not too bad. And actually, that thermal paste looks kind of fresh. That's surprising. I'd speculate that somebody was actually taking care of this thing, but that dust buildup kind of suggests otherwise. Let's clean that thing up. Kind of hard to see on camera, but it is indeed a Helleron. 2.6 gigahertz, 256K cache, and 533 megahertz FSB. And I'm just gonna leave it in there for the sake of de-dustification. Let's see the RAM. And that could well be the original stick. 256 megs of PC2700 DDR1, made by Samsung. Slightly dusty. Let's disconnect the drives. And motherboard power, why not? Yeah, that motherboard's a mess. Let's get it out of there. And this machine does have random faceplate connectors. I always record these on the off chance that somebody's watching and needs that info. And it's also handy to look back on for myself. Yeah, check that out. Not a single bulgy leaky cap. That's pretty remarkable. I do want to get this Northbridge heatsink off because it's going to need thermal paste. Ah, oh, these are my least favorite clips ever. Hey, it was actually still kind of mushy. That's surprising. Let's clean that up. That's better. Commencing de-dustification. Okay, now I'll pull that chip. No trouble on the pins, although my alcohol made it to this side. That'll be dry long before it causes any trouble. This is one of the newer systems I've had on this channel. Let's see how that translates to battery life. Not well. That's about as dead as the previous system. Okay, let's see if I can get this duct off in one piece. There we go. Yeah, at least these screws were tight. And it's probably safe to say this thing has never been cleaned before. Yeah, I think this one was worse. And you know, I got so carried away, I didn't even check the fan bearing. Let's do that. All right, sounds great. That fan moves a lot of air. Guess the Helleron makes a lot of heat. Okay, let's get these chips taken care of. These are always so nerve wracking to get on. You gotta make sure they go down flat and even. Otherwise it could crack the chip.
Okay, let's pull these drives. And the hard drive is a Western Digital Caviar, 60 gigabytes, so it's probably original. Manufactured October 11th, 2004. And Officer Murphy was made by HL Data Storage. That stands for Hitachi LG. Manufactured November 2004. And he sure looks dusty these days. And there's nothing special or cute about this power supply. This thing feels terrible. There is not nearly enough weight in this thing. Especially not with it claiming to be a 400 watt supply. I don't believe it for a second. But let's see if we can blow it up. Okay, well it has some life at least. When are we ever just gonna get a good smoke show out of one of these? Well, not today apparently. That thing survived five minutes. Guess it's good enough. Let me try not to kick up the dust in this thing. Let's try to keep that out of the air. And we are back together, at least as far as I can get it. Let's see what it does. And it starts without a power button push. Ah, oh, that blue LED around the E-Machines E, e kind of gets me. I haven't seen that in a very long time. And we are posting. Okay, let's go set our date and time so we get good timestamps. I'm guessing this is 24 hour time. Fine with me. All right. Save changes and exit. I'm not sure if that fan quiets down. That thing is loud. Hmm, that may not be a good sign. But we are booting. Oh, the E-Machines modified wallpaper. Oh, we got a password. Guessing it's not blank. Nope. We're gonna have to get into Canopics and crack that. So I guess we're testing that CD drive early. Ah, oh, it doesn't open. Oh, there it goes. Just needed a little convincing. I'm not even going to be able to hear it spin up over that CPU fan running at full bore. Let's go ahead and reboot. Yeah, we did not boot the CD. Let's check all the usual suspects. It is spinning up in there. Maybe it's just a BIOS thing. Boot device priority. Ah, that explains it. That should work better. Yeah, there we go. That sure is a noisy thing. Just like I remember it. Man, that is quite the resolution there. I'm gonna have to fix that. Let's see what we have. Yeah, we are set to full HD. Didn't realize this thing was capable of that. Let's go with 1360 by 768. What? It says it right there. Okay, fine. We'll do 1280 by 1024. Eh, close enough. At least that's probably easier to read. Let's embiggen that. Jeez, everything revs that CD drive up. All right, let's clear this out. See if we got that hard drive and FS tab. Yep, gotta be SDA1. And there's our wind stall. Let's get in there. Let's get in the System32. It's probably capitalized. Nope, it's always random it seems like. Slash config. Should have Sam Hive in there. Yep, there it is. Now let's run CHNTPW on that Sam Hive. Let's blank that password. And that should be all we need. So let's back out of here and write that out. Good, good. Now let's get back to Windows. Oh, and I hacked in a quieter fan because it felt like my ears were about to explode. There, that's more like it.
There are updates ready for my computer. Lovely. And Cakewalk Pro Audio 9. So somebody was into audio. Well, maybe. It seems kind of unused. And they never selected their MIDI outputs. Just continue. Cave Monsters? Let's open that up. Oh, they were using it. What are the chances the cave monsters are copyrighted? There's only one way to find out. Uh, okay, that's not music. Okay, maybe it is music. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is getting weird. Weirder. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> I guess it just goes on like this. Okay, that part looks like music. I guess I'll just let it play, and I'll skip ahead and post. Is that? Is that? I think I see sunlight. <laughs> okay, I can't take any more. It's not bad, but I am not playing this whole thing. Well, I guess that was the end anyway. Oh well, you get the idea. Let's get out of here. Let's see, what is Soul Seek? Soul Seek is corrupt. There's some poetry somewhere in there. What else do we have? What is this? 3D audio configuration. Oh, this. I remember this. Well, that's not going to do me any good with my two speaker setup. What else do we have? What is Pixella? Image Mixer VCD2. I guess that's for making VCDs? Let's open that up. VCD will be Video CD. Let's see, do we have any projects? Nope. At least not there. Okay, let's get out of here. What were those picture packages? Oh, I thought it was something related to those picture CDs that film developers would give you back in the day. Yeah, back when we used film cameras, you had the option to receive your pictures in digital format, and they came on CDs. Wow, I haven't thought about that in decades. Handycam tools. Maybe this is some kind of Sony thing. There's a lot of them. Well, let's see what this one is. Okay. It's a strange thing. I'm guessing this is just a little sample video. Well, that's interesting. Let's get out of here. Let's see, what else? What do we have in games? Probably the default Windows games. Yep. Let's see if they ever used their included AOL install. Nope. Guess not. Let's see if they were using iTunes. What is this? Why does this keep popping up? Stay offline. Yeah, they sure were. That is quite the iTunes library. Yeah, they were really using this. Look at all these artists. Obviously, I can't play any of this. Cool, cool. And there's really not much else. Let's see if they're using Windows Movie Maker for anything. Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Wow, it has been so long since I've even seen Windows Movie Maker. Let's see if this one has anything in it. Well, maybe it did at one time. Those video files are gone. Okay. 
Well, let's try to get a last use date on this thing. See what Event Viewer has to say. Let's just scroll past the current day. Looks like 2012. This thing had quite the life. Yeah, pretty consistently used all the way up to that time. They got their money's worth out of this system. All right, let's see what's on the root of that drive. And about halfway full, and it thinks it has a floppy drive. Well, what is this recovery thing? It's got to just be an alternate partition, right? And it's got music on it. Let's see if that's part of the hard drive. Yep, sure is. I guess that was the factory recovery partition that they just repurposed for music. That's interesting. Nothing much on the root directory, except yet more audio. Now that's the Cakewalk folder. It's an interesting parallel, because we were using RE machines to do audio stuff back then. Okay, well, nothing much more to see here. I'd love to know what's trying to make these web requests. We might have some spyware on this thing. Well, let's do an error check on that hard drive. But you know what, that's only going to check this one partition. It's going to be better to go into Canopics and do that with bad blocks. Let's do that. And that's the speed it's supposed to be running at. This will take a while though. And we have no errors. Also, I let the system run overnight so this could complete. And my house is still unincinerated, so that's a plus. Yeah, never thought I'd be catching feelings for one of these systems. Nostalgia does some funny things. And despite E-Machines being a budget PC brand, these two systems are actually really well built. And this case is like a tank. It's actually made of some really thick sheet metal. And as a result, it's quite heavy. It feels so weird to actually be fond of this thing. I was very much neutral to negative on them back in the day, especially since my brothers had the ATI chipset, the arch nemesis of every Linux fanboy in the mid-2000s, and I was no exception. Now I'm gonna have to find something to fill this blank here. I'm sure I'll come across something in my e-waste pursuits. You know what, I think we need to put that never obsolete claim to the test in a future video. Even though it's just marketing spiel, it might be good for a laugh to see how it handles modern tasks. And this channel is your patron dollars at work. And pounds, and euros, and kroner, and dollar dues. Thank you all so much. And if you like this video, I got a lot more like it, and a lot more coming. So be sure to subscribe and check those out. But that's all for this one. Thanks for watching.